Good morning. Hello, everybody. Just a quick check that you can hear me. You know, you put your put your thumbs up if you can hear me loud and clear. Fantastic. Okay, hi. Really glad um, that you could make it today. Nice to see a mixture of old friends and new faces. Um, we seem to be getting used to this as a as a as an online virtual alternative to days in actual fields and with the upsides. I'm um, not being too concerned about the weather, although I noticed it actually would have been quite a nice day to be in a field today, um, that we haven't had to drive around the country, and of course that we can be in both Cornwall and Suffolk at the same time, which is novel. Um, but still, we look forward to getting back out there and seeing you all in person. Um, in the meantime, hope you're comfy, hope you've got your own cup of tea on the go, um, and I hope you're ready for what promises to be a really interesting morning. Um, we're recording this, this is being recorded, so by sticking around you're, con you're consenting to that. You can welcome to turn off your video if you don't want your face to be um, recorded. Um, and to view in, in retrospect, um, you'll be able to do that through our website or through the Agricology website. In the very unlikely event that we get gate crashed, um, I'll end the meeting and we'll rearrange. There's two basis points attached to this meeting. Um, to claim them, if you can type your 200 number, so your registration number starting 200, if you can type that into the chat directly to, to me, um, then I can send that on to basis as proof and they should come through to you. We'll be finishing by 12.30 today, so an hour and a half. Um, I'm gonna start with a quick poll. This is mainly for, for our background information. Um, just to get a feel for who's here and, and what your interests are. Um, we've got around 30 people with us at the moment, and a few more might still be turning up. And if you could tick the roles most relevant to your coming along today, and I think you probably should be, you should be able to, if I've programmed it right, you should be able to tick more than one, which is fine as well. Okay. Few more people still to vote. Yeah, lovely. I think that's pretty much everyone. Okay. And I would be fascinated that for the 50% of people who've put other, I, I would actually be very interested to know kind of what capacity you are hearing. So I've obviously missed out an important um, an, an important title on that poll. So if, if you would be up for just um, letting me know through the chat who you're here as journalists, fantastic. And um, that'd be brilliant, thank you. Okay, so on to the knob of the subject, integrated pest management. So integrated pest management is not, I'm sure you'll agree, a new thing. It's what growers do and it's what growers have always done. It's about putting together all the available pieces of the jigsaw in the best way possible and trying to mitigate against every conceivable adversity. But it's taken on a new urgency over the last few years as some of the one-stop shop chemical solutions that we've really come to rely on have been falling away. So at the same time, or perhaps as a response to this, our understanding and appreciation of the capacity of more complex systems to provide new solutions to, to age old problems has grown exponentially. It's an exciting time. IPM has been a really fundamental premise of the crop health and protection aspect of integrated farm management um, since Leaf's inception in 1991. So our 2020 Leaf Global Impacts Report found that 52% of the 936 Leaf Mark certified businesses worldwide were demonstrating best practice in all eight areas of IPM. The principle of continuous improvement within the LeafMark standard and the integrated farm management mindset drives all, including these 52% to keep moving in a positive direction on this. Practical, realistic and innovative solutions are what we are into at LEAF. And with about 43% of UK grown fruit and veg being produced to the LeafMark standard, even if it doesn't always appear on the shelves labeled as such, these solutions are clearly working in practice on a broad scale. So just a really quick recap, the definition of IPM provided by the European Union Framework Directive on the sustainable use of pesticides, which currently guides 
our legislative landscape is this. I'm going to read out the definition. Integrated pest management means careful consideration of all available plant protection methods and subsequent integration of appropriate measures that discourage the development of populations of harmful organisms and keep the use of plant protection products and other forms of intervention to levels that are economically and ecologically justified and reduce or minimise risks to human health and the environment. Integrated pest management emphasises the growth of a healthy crop with the least possible disruption to agroecosystems and encourages natural pest control mechanisms. So this is broken down into eight principles which are in a sequence of consideration. Number one, preventing and suppressing the buildup of harmful organisms. Number two, monitoring pest populations and forecasting their impact. Number three, the use of thresholds to determine when to intervene. Number four, considering all options for pest control, including non-chemical. Number five, selection of appropriate interventions, considering all potential risks involved. Number six, minimizing chemical use by maximizing efficiency of application. Number seven, strategizing to prevent the buildup of resistance in pest populations. And number eight, reviewing the success of a chosen strategy. The overriding principle here is that no one of these stands alone, but combine all available strategies, including informed inaction, including doing nothing, if that's the appropriate thing to do, to find the most appropriate solution for an individual system. So we published earlier this year at LEAF, Simply Sustainable IPM is a um, on-farm guide to putting each of these eight steps into action. And you can access this either through the link that Katie's about to put in the chat now um, or through our website. And it showcases some of the IPM being demonstrated on leaf farms across a range of sectors across the country, across the world, actually. Today, though, we're looking at IPM specifically in field veg. So it's a hot topic. I'm sure you all who have made it here today would agree. Um, actives are falling away, and yet the pressure to produce fresh seasonal veg year round is undiminished or indeed growing. There's never ever been a more prescient time than now to get all the tools in the box oiled up and working together. And the imperative is to be looking at whole system approaches that lend resilience to soils, plants, businesses, communities. Some growers really stand out and lead the way as an industry, we learn and devise new solutions. And I'm more than delighted, I'm really happy, and thank you very much for being here, to be bringing together today four horticulturalists who are taking forward the IPM practices in UK field veg production. All are linked through the leaf through their work in this area is research, practice, demonstration, marketing, development, knowledge exchange. And as ever in IFM, we believe that these complementary elements of a system make for even more than the sum of their parts through integration with each other. So first up, we have Riviera Produce. It is one of Cornwall's biggest producers, a Leafmark certified business and responsible for about half of the county's brassica output. They've also supplied Morrisons this year with the monster pumpkins that you might come across in their shops foyers this month. We have two representatives from the company with us today. So first up, we've got agronomist Ellis Luckhurst with a bit of background and some detail on the varietal selection that's a really important part of their IFM strategy. Over to you, Ellis. Uh, Is that working? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, like we said, I'm just going to cover some um, vegetable variety development. And I thought I would start with a bit of a background to the company Riviera Produce Limited down here in Cornwall. So Riviera was started by David Simmons, uh, started by David Simmons' family, should I say, in 1870. Um, originally had a 160 acre farm and it is now up to 8,000 acres and we, we additionally market another 1,000 acres of crop from six local growers who are committed to Riviera. 
We've got over 150 years of experience of growing the crops. Um, we're, we've got the vision to be the leading brassica grower in the UK. Uh, Tom Simmons, David's son, has recently joined the business, and he's the sixth generation uh, to be farming the family business in West Cornwall. Uh, Riviera itself, through its growing arm, P. Simmons and Son, grows about 83% of what is sold. Uh, the remaining 14% comes from growers with a little bit from imports for the out of season supply. On the seasonality, this chart just shows where we are in terms of UK produce. So we're 12 months of the year harvesting, 52 weeks of the year cauliflower and spring greens. The pointy cabbage, we have an import window in February, March, and maybe a little bit of April when it comes from Spain. And the Savoy cabbage, we can push a little bit later, but we have a gap in May. It comes from Spain, the same as the kale. And then for broccoli and uh, courgettes, we are in the summer production only, harvesting from June through until October, November. This map just gives an indication of where our growers are based. Um, the RP there is the Packhouse site um, in between Campbell and Hale. And then we have our growers spread about. Uh, the reason the numbers are not sequential is we used to have up to 50 growers, but of course, uh, economies of scale mean that they've gradually dropped away and we've currently got six. Uh, our land base, which is mainly rented land, spreads from up near Padstow, uh, right down to Land's End, down to Lizard Peninsula, right across the whole of Cornwall, which gives us a huge range of microclimates. So we find that cauliflower planted on the same day across all the different locations we've got can give us a spread of harvest up to maybe two or three weeks difference just by the different temperatures we get between all those different sites. Just a little bit of um, Picking up Cornwall here with the climate, um, because we're close to the sea, we get a milder and more temperate climate in other parts of the UK. So we're cooler in the summer, we're warmer in the winter, which means we get more even growth. We also like to think we get a slightly wetter summer, so we get more moisture, which brassicas need for steady growth, which gives us less peaks and troughs in supply. Our rainfall is usually about double that of other parts of the UK, particularly over on the east. And in the bottom right there, there's a small chart, which is actually September 2015 compared to 16, which just shows the Cornwall remained fairly steady in those two years, whereas other parts were absolutely red hot. We do irrigate some of the crops in the summer, which gives us the capacity to improve the quality. So in terms of IPM and varietal development, the seed companies, um, I see a number of you are here today, working very hard to introduce uh, naturally occurring ring spot and leaf disease resistance into the brassica range. The advantages of this is that it's going to allow us to reduce fungicide use. Um, it's going to give us a marketable crop where we have difficult spraying conditions. We can have particularly wet, windy autumns in particular, which means we're unable to get on with early fungicides. Uh, where we've got resistant varieties, that's not an issue. Where we haven't got resistant varieties, we can lose crops to ring spot in severe cases. And also through using this naturally occurring resistance, we can reduce the incident of diseases which become resistant to fungicides. This image just shows a breeding trial where there is a development of some disease resistant variety. So on the left hand side of the photo, the line of the variety going up the field there is a standard non resistant variety, and this field wasn't sprayed with any fungicide at all. And it's absolutely pickled with particularly ring spot, but also canary and other diseases. The cauliflower variety on the right hand side is one of the new disease resistant varieties, which is showing much lower, if non existent, levels of disease. So, in terms of integrated pest management, this largely allows us to reduce inputs. And we have been under pressure from retailers, the public, and also regulatory to reduce applications and we've been losing active ingredients anyway so it's a direction of travel which has been coming on for many years but over the past five years we've made the following achievements in terms of IPM so we've had a new approval in the last few years for a module drench for brassicas which is very marked or cyan for 
and that is a systemic insecticide which is applied to the small plants has allowed us to reduce our field applied broadcast insecticide by approximately 50 percent so that has been a real game changer um, the disease resistant cauliflower varieties allow us to use up to 75 percent less fungicide now because we haven't got full resistance in all of the 30 odd winter cauliflower varieties that we use across the season, we think that we've probably reduced fungicide by about 25% so far across the whole acreage. And that is going to increase as we introduce more disease resistant, resistant varieties. Now it's going to take decades to get there, but eventually um, we should have disease resistance right through the range. Unfortunately, it's not a single gene resistance, so it's a very difficult thing to bring into the varieties, but the major gene has been identified, and with the selective breeding, uh, the new varieties are coming forward. The other advantage that this allows is for increased vigour, so we um, couple this with use of strip tillage, which um, maybe Thomas will be talking about in a minute, and that's allowed us to reduce uh, fertiliser use by around 35%, which is a huge saving to the business. And it's, of course, the, coupled with all of this is an increase in quality and marketable yield. So where yield goes up with reductions going down, it's a perfect situation. These are just some pictures that one of the plant breeders sent me just to show the sort of thing that they're using to identify the resistance. The picture on the right is a cauliflower that's completely shows no resistance at all to leaf diseases. On the left, the we've got a mixture of resistance and non-resistance, and they can select out the ones that have got some of that resistance in it, breed that into the new varieties. But that's not really possible to put it back into existing varieties. So as a quick gallop through, but just in conclusion, the challenges we've got for the new varietal development and bringing the resistance in. Firstly, although disease resistance is important, we have to have the quality of the final vegetable has got to meet the marketable requirements, the specifications of the supermarket. And that is absolutely key. We've had this before with other things like club root resistance and other diseases where we where um, resistance has been developed, but the quality of the final curd not good enough for it to be used widely as a marketable product. The other thing we need is uniform resistance, but robust because nature will always find a way to overcome that resistance. So it's a continual replacement of varieties over the years to bring in new levels of resistance to continue to try to overcome that, that natural um, disease that's coming into the plant. The other issue is the timescales. So in terms of winter cauliflower in particular, because it's a long cycle crop and it's in the ground for possibly up to 10, 11 months, it can take up to 10 years for a first cross variety to reach commercial availability. Now that could be shortened by GM technology, but currently that's unacceptable for the UK market. We're not using that. So the, it's a constant process of improvement and disease resistance is a tool which we can use to develop the quality vegetable finished products which meet the consumer demand. That way we can increase grow profitability because we have increased yields. And the plan is that we do that by working with the environment as we're about to talk about, reducing the inputs which saves us money and is good for the environment and improves soil health. And that is me finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. That's great. Thank you ever so much. So next we've got David Thomas, who's the farm manager. And if you've got questions about Rivia, I've got questions for Ellis. If you'd like to put them in the chat and we'll set him and David about those questions after, um, after we've had David, please. And then we actually went to visit David Thomas and Ellis down at Riviera just at the end of last month. Um, and they were kind enough to take us around some of their growing sites um, and, and show us some of the changes they've made over the past couple of years. Um, we made a short film in slightly adverse conditions um, and we're going to show it to you now. Um, basically, the outcome of the changes that have been made are 
cropping patterns that are more resilient to variations in weather, less dependent on chemistry, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. Um, I will show you the film now. I, so I'm going to share it on my screen, but if your internet isn't strong, you might, you might want to um, watch it through the YouTube link that Katie's just put in the chat as well. Okay, so, so if this works, ready? Riviera produce. We're farming um, uh, several acres, well, over over six and a half thousand acres in uh, West Cornwall. Um, our, the main crop we're growing are brassicas, which um, range from cauliflower, calabrese, uh, spring greens, pointed cabbage, savoys, and, and so on. You, you seem to get a key pest every year. Um, sometimes it'll be diamondback moth. Other other years will be aphids. Um, since since we've been using the very mark, it is it's reduced in the early stages of the crop. And um, by, by crop walking and, and uh, monitoring, um, we, we've um, we target towards the end of the growing season. Disease, we, we look at resistant varieties as much as we can. Um, weeds, we've actually um, made a big push this year to reduce herbicide use and we're using more mechanical methods of um, inter-row cultivations which is working very well for us um, and of course it's rotation and knowing the land is, is the other part of it. All the strip tiller is is a single leg with a foot on the bottom um, and there's a, there's a disc each side of it, and it simply drags through the soil and bubbles up the, the soil in that strip, which um, then breaks it down good enough to plant in. Um, there's no power drive, there's no, you know, there's no, so a, a tractor can be ticking over and pulling it. Um, a, a bit of speed, the faster you can go, the better the tilth. All you're doing is cultivating the one strip you need to put your plant in. Um, down at sort of uh, eight inches, nine inches, so the, you know, the, the root of the plant will go straight down, and as it's going down, we found it goes out sideways in, in between the, the layers of the soil. We'll find the layers of the soil and go sideways as well. So um, you are using all of the field, um, even though you think you're just using the one slot. What we're finding um, with the strip, strip tiller is better soil drainage. Um, more even crops um, because every plant has got the same chance um, and you know we, we're finding that we aren't getting um, harvesting rigs stuck on this sort of ground because it's more um, the ground is more um, consolidated and holds, holds up all the machinery so we're not causing compaction and ruts um, or so we think and um, yeah generally a lot happier with the, with the crop behind it. It's actually faster overall because we haven't had to plow the ground. There is a piece of saving, we haven't worked it out exactly, but we know it's cheaper. And in catchy weather, um, you know, if it's if you're working in showers, um, you haven't got to touch the ground until you need it. When you plow a field, you lose moisture. Yeah. And by not disturbing the soil and planting much more minimum tillage, we're retaining the soil moisture and the soil structure. And that gives us a more even crop. There's two distinct seasons. You've got your winter cauliflower and a summer cauliflower. Summer's a lot more simple. We have three, two or three varieties which we plant weekly and then we harvest them sequentially. Then when we get to the winter crop, which is this, we have maybe well, there's probably 30 main varieties and then we've got another 20 or 30 trials. And those are all planted roughly in July and then they've got a different length of day between when you plant them and you harvest them. So if you plant 50 varieties all on the same day and they're some are 80 day varieties and they go 82, some go up to 200 and something days. So it um, just gives you that continuity right through the winter. The idea is to get the most UK product we can on the UK shelves. We don't want to import and we've got the kind of pressures of Brexit mainly but also coronavirus. Um, exchange rate fluctuations, all sorts of reasons why we'd rather not import through the winter. So having a 12 month crop like cauliflower is great.
and we're selecting plants for disease resistance. You know, the varieties are becoming more resistant as we develop new, new varieties to use. All crops have a fungicide to keep the leaf clean, but we are working more and more towards uh, resistant varieties that are being bred in by the seed companies. So we've got several varieties of cauliflower now. We will use perhaps 40 or 50 different varieties through the winter cauliflower season, but um, we have got a few main varieties we use, and we try to go for the ones which have got a good quality head, supermarket quality head when it comes to maturity, which gives us a high yield. We're also looking at things like um, tolerance to leaf disease and it's more of a tolerance than a resistance but we've got some new varieties coming through which have definitely got more tolerance than others so that means if the weather's not there for spraying and we miss a spray we still don't get losses through leaf disease. This particular field was in um, uh, summer cauliflower um, so we, we harvested uh, cauliflower off this field in July um, and then first week of August, uh, when the crop was finished, it was um, lightly dissed over. We lightly dissed in the, the, the cover crop of uh, Phacelia, blindseed and clover. Um, we've been doing this for two or three years now, um, and we've noticed a, a, a great improvement in the soil structure and the, the amount of wildlife, uh, such as worms um, and all the stuff you can't see. Um, so the, 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 the soil health is definitely improving through, through this practice. First shovel full, you see more worms. So they're all, all busy, all being protected by the, by the cover crop above them. And, you know, some lovely crumbly pre-soil there. Look. This particular field, um, it'll be left here for most of the winter. Um, It'll maintain a little bit of green in the winter months in Cornwall because we're, we're milder. Um, and then in the spring, this will probably be planted in cauliflower again. Um, so the, the, we've, we've actually stopped ploughing land now. Um, this will be just dissed off um, lightly. And then we've got a, a Vanderstack crosscut machine, which will be run over it, um, which will destroy, it will break all the the dead material into short pieces of um, debris um, and then we run a strip tiller through it and start planting behind the strip tiller. Um, th there's a few issues um, if you've got too good a co cover crop planting the following crop can be an issue um, but we're, we're getting better at that um, we, we get to a certain stage um, and it all depends which time of the year you're targeting we, we, we start planting in early March and we finished planting in October, so you know you, each each cover crop's got to be sort of um, tailored to, to suit what's what's being planted behind it. Um, so um, you know destroying the crop, the, the cover crop, at the right time is key. We are seeing a, a, an impact on the, the following crop. Um, they're tending to get more more even now, um, more healthy. Um, they're um, yeah, a lot, lot happier crops basically. I'm fairly sure the cover crops are bringing in um, beneficials, you know. If you stand and watch um, a flowering crop of Phacelia long enough, you'll see you'll see all sorts of um, hoverflies, ladybirds, um, plus, plus other things I've never seen before, if I'm honest. But um, yes, um, I, I'm sure they're bringing in more insects. Um, it's certainly the, the bees love it when it starts flowering, which has got to be good, isn't it? I think we, we naturally want to work with the environment. Um, because you know we're rotating these fields, we're not sort of one crop in and gone. We're we're, going, we're coming back and year on year. We're we're very dependent for our business is very dependent on healthy soil. Um, so if you don't look after your soil, your your business suffers basically. My role is to put the crop programs together, which is building in a sales plan and a growing variety planting plan to try and equate the acreage to the predicted sales and. By using the cover crops, we've found we have much more even availability. Like I've been 
been saying we've changed lots of things over the last few years. Um, we're, we're, we're cover cropping, we're, um, which is bringing in be beneficials. Um, we're, we're, we're strip tilling ground, which is improving the structure and um, bringing the worms back. Um, is we aren't getting it all right. Um, I, I don't think we ever will get everything perfect. Um, but um, it, you know, if you're thinking about going down this route, don't be afraid to try it. Um, and don't stick with, um, we've always done it like this. We're not gonna change. much for all your help with that David and Ennis. Really um, great examples of multifaceted pest control. You've got cultural, rotational, biological, varietal, that targeted chemical. Um, and when we were with you we talked too about the really physical strategies that you employ against rabbits and pigeons which is all part of the picture too in terms of integrated pest management. Um, I think it's possible and fair to say that every principle of IPM is, is represented in your system. I mean, it's clearly working for you. It's working not just for you, it's working for the soils that you're working with and us, your happy customers. Um, the really striking thing for me, Ellis, about your presentation is that fertilizer saving, the fertilizer um, input reduction that's kind of a knock on effect of uh, pest management strategies. Now, Katie, can I ask you, are there any questions in the chat? Have we got any questions for Ellis and David? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, I had a couple through. One from Andy Evans. Do you have issues with club root, club root due to no significant rotation? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll answer that one. Yeah. Uh, we, do, we do suffer with club root, um, but we do maintain a high pH um, on, on most of our, or all of our permanent land, um, which um, works very well. We, and um, when we get club root, it's in sort of short-term short land, basically. Um, you know, it's, it's all about finding out the history and making sure um, the brassica hasn't been in the rotation um, on a low pH, basically. If that answers that one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, Katie, you're on mute. Yeah, we've got another one. Oh. Can you give us some examples of recent changes in chemical options and how have you needed to adapt? Well, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of chemicals disappearing. Um, I, I suppose that the, the biggest change we've made recently is um, is, is dropping out of herbicides. Um, we, we've um, grown all the winter collie this year and, and spring greens um, without the use of any residual herbicides. We're using cultural methods, mechanical control, um, and that, that seems to be working very well for us. Fantastic. And something else on that, Ellis? I mentioned the um, well, one of the things we've lost a lot of recently is aphicides. We seem to be very limited on aphid control. Uh, luckily, we've got the very mark, which gives us some control for the first, what do you reckon, David, six to eight weeks of the crop? Six to eight weeks, yes, yeah. We get that from the very mark, so that takes the crop food to a fairly decent frame. Um, after that, we have we are very limited on what we can apply to control aphids. So. That, that is a major issue and that is something which I think maybe uh, Dawn might talk about a bit later because there's an industry we need to come together, a uh, bicycle industry, and just identify where these gaps are coming and start lobbying now for keeping these active ingredients because some of the decisions made, uh, particularly at European level, seem to be a little bit bewildering really because they will take away <coughs> excuse me, seed treatments where we might use a tiny amount of an active ingredient to control the pest, which leaves growers with the only option to <coughs> apply large broadcast areas of insecticides. So <coughs> we're taking away a very small application and replacing it with a large scale one, which seems a bit short-sighted. 
Absolutely, yeah. Is there anything that you've observed within the, the practices that you've put in place that has had an impact on aphid control or it's it's a gap that you're looking to close? Well, like I say, the very marked drench has, has helped control that in the start of the crop life. Um, mm. After that, we've got gaps, so we're, we're firefighting really. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, hopefully Dawn can fill us in a bit with that as well. And I'm conscious there are other people on the call, perhaps um, Charlotte Rowley um, later might have comments on that. I've um, got another question here. We've got time, Lucy. Yeah, yeah, one more question. Yeah. Um, so with the strip tillage, do you use GPS systems to line up planters with the strips or is this done by the operator? Yeah, it's all it's all GPS. Um, we've got RTK on the um, strip till machine and then either center point or FS3 on the planting tractors, which is good enough to follow the, the first mark. Um, obviously, that's very important to be on the right mark. Um, if you're off it, you're in solid ground, basically. So, uh, yeah, all, all the tractors got GPS in them. I, I've just got a related question here come through about the strip tilling. Um, oh, no, sorry. This is about mechanical weeding. How many mechanical passes do you use versus a herbicide? And what's the cost difference? Do, 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 you, do you notice that it's more expensive to, to operate weed control mechanically or, or not? We, up, up till now, we've been using a combination of um, herbicides and mechanical um, uh, weeding as well. Um, some, some fields we haven't really noticed any difference in because we, we put our, our pre-emergent on and then a few weeks later you're hoeing anyway um, so cleaner fields you have you might have another uh, an extra pass with a with a mechanical hoe but um, the dirtier fields yes you know you may be five or six times um, cost wise you know the herbicides aren't cheap anymore um, I, I remember um, when, when we started using herbicides it was trefland back then that was two pound fifty an acre which made mechanical methods expensive but um now some some of the some of the um the herbicides you're using are very expensive um so cost wise is, is probably it's not a lot of difference and i've got one last question which segues on nicely to dawn's which is just briefly do you have you've mentioned diamond back moth um, in, your, in your presentation, do you have any issues with it overwintering on your farms and the resistance problems to pyrethroids? So, definitely pyrethroid resistance. Um, I've, I've never found one in the winter, <laughs> um, but I've not really looked that hard in the winter either. So, <laughs> yeah. Right, thank you. That brings us on nicely to Dawn Teverson, so as National Knowledge Exchange Manager for AHDB's Broadacre Field Veg. And department. Uh, Dawn's going to give us an insight into the national monitoring programs that play a really important part in IPM strategies across the veg sector for a range of different crops. Um, and over to you, Dawn. That's, that's looking good on the slide. Yep, you're up. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction on, on the couple of things which I'll pick up in my talk. So, Good morning, my name's Dawn Teverson and I'm Research and Knowledge Exchange Manager for Field Veg at AHDB. So this is by Field Veg, it's not the whole range of Field Veg, uh, but specifically brassicas, onions, carrots and vining peas. So the main problem when I was putting my um, presentation together was what to pick out and what you would find interesting. So I hope I've made the right decisions, but we're only dipping our toe in the water of the range of work that we do in AHDB. So if there's anything that is glaringly obviously not here or you'd like to know about, please do get back to me later. So this presentation will concentrate on examples of IPM principles. As I've said, I can't cover them all. I haven't got answers to them all. Um, but I will look at number five and six, which are pesticide selection and reduced use. Number two, monitoring. Number three, decisions. And number seven, anti-resistance strategies. 
Um, we also have a grower-led work in Scotland video. This is my strategic centre for Bill Veg in Scotland, which is very well entirely brassica based um, at East of Scotland Grower. That was only actually put up last night, so it is very, very new. So just briefly, why do we use IPM? I think a lot of this has already been answered. Um, lots of plant protection products, as you can tell from the comments, this is getting really, really serious for growers. It's increasing concern about the environment and that's feeding through consumers to supermarket pressure on growers to produce the product with less tools in the toolbox. IPM is central to AHDB strategy going forward. EMUs. So EMUs are extension of authorization for minor use, as probably everybody, most people listening today know that you need authorization for any chemistry that's used, not just chemistry, for biologicals as well. And AHDB has delivered over 560 of these since 2013. The big project we have at the moment that does all this work um, is called SEPTA Plus, and it's helped growers protect their crops, assessing a range of bioprotectants and botanicals alongside conventional pesticides. And just referring back to, to the video, this is some of the work that we've been doing in Scotland is taking the promising products out of Sector Plus and trialling them on growers' fields. And obviously in Scotland, as we've heard, you know, there's lots of different microenvironments in Cornwall, and those are quite different to the conditions that people are working with in Scotland. So 71 trials on 50 different crops and 54 target pest weeds and diseases. That's brought us 259 new and promising products. So I'm not going to, you'll be glad to know, read all this out, but this is a range of different weeds, diseases and insects pests that we've been working on. And just to pick up on the bean seed fly, anybody who's interested in that, we have a webinar on the 9th of December with Warwick University with Rosemary Collier and also PGRO. We've got a um, PhD student working on this and that will be the basis of that meeting to get all the updates, well as a range of other activities. Another one I'd like to pick out is botrytis in stored cabbage, which has been a particular problem in Lincolnshire last year. As everybody can remember, we had an absolutely awful um, autumn last year. So the crop going into store was badly affected and growers re were really suffering um, with the proportion of crop that they were managing to get out of store. So with the strategic centres work that I'm doing, we're setting up a trial um, next month in Lincolnshire and hopefully we'll be taking the useful products coming out of Sceptre Plus and trialling those in a real life situation. OK, again, just to give you a flavour of the range of work that we're doing. Um, bacterial pathogens, I'll pick that one out for comment. Um, we're looking at different ways of combating bacterial pathogens, which were a particular um, problem. Spear rot in Calabrese yeah, um, uh, is a particular problem, also known as head rot. And we're doing work at East of Scotland Growers on that. And it links up with a bigger project on bacterial pathogens that we're doing at AHDB. If you have a look at the video, you'll see what we're doing in Scotland on that. So one thing I'd like to um, concentrate a little bit on is the pest bulletin. This is um, 
the monitoring that we do of a whole range of different pests. Um, it's hosted on the Syngenta website. Um, and as I say, this is available for more than 20 different pest species. What we've got there depends on the particular pest. So, for example, for 13 different species, we've got forecasts available and those can be used to, to um, put together the, the pest management strategy over the season. What we do every week during the growing season is to send out um, a broadcast email from AHDB. This is put together by Rosemary Collier from Warwick University. She's an entomologist, she's a real expert on pests, and she basically takes um, all the monitoring data, looks at it and flags up for growers in a few sentences what they need to be looking at, what they need to be out there crop walking. So one of my particular, um, I won't say favourites because that perhaps gives the wrong impression, but um, areas of interest is diamondback moth. And this is Rosemary and myself. We did go out to Somerset in January 2018. It was actually on the way back from the um, variety trials in Cornwall. And we spent a very cold day looking around Swedefield with Andrew Rutherford, who's the, the grower here in the middle picture. And we found eight caterpillars of diamondback moth. The significance of this is that diamondback moth is an invasive species, along with silver Y, that comes in during the summer. And it was perceived not to be an insect which could overwinter in this pro in this country. Whether that is a result of global warming, I don't know, but that is the situation. We found a small number of overwintering caterpillars in the crops. So what we do in the summer, as I say, this is a, um, an invasive pest. We, first of all, it's a bit of a two pronged attack here. So we have um, a chap at Warwick who 24 seven every day, he uploads information from half a dozen different websites all over Europe onto the Warwick website, which is easily accessible for growers, where they're putting up numbers of diamondback moth all around Europe. We also have grower led monitoring in commercial crops. So this is a whole range of different microclimates, grow, brassica growers who monitor their crops and report back. And that is all put on the Warwick website and is accessible for everybody to access. Another one I'm picking out last year we had feedback from growers that there was problems with Swede midge in brassicas. This is a problem because it's a tiny little midge and it takes out the growing point of the seedling. So obviously when the growing point's been taken out, that ruins that particular plant. So we, again, we set up, um, we set up a monitoring system all around the UK, and this was would, this was reported back yesterday at the Brassica Grower Meeting. And in some areas, the crops, you know, there were just small amounts, but in other areas, there were very, very high numbers. So all this monitoring feeds into making decisions on crop management using thresholds, and this is one of the crucial parts of integrated pest management. It's used to inform spray decisions, biologicals, or as a last resort, conventional chemistry. And it's also, the pest bulletin is also used to inform the regulatory broad bodies, the people who make decisions on whether growers get their, in, well, we're talking insecticides here, um, which is CRD. 
So once we've got the chemistry, we have to look after it. And with some pests, historically, and not necessarily in the UK, worldwide, this hasn't happened. Again, I'm going to use diamondback moth as a risk an example of this, but it's also um, happened in a whole range of different pests. And as, as has been alluded to previously, um, pyrethroid insecticides, we had growers submit samples of diamondback moth from all over the UK to our project. Um, we've got an ongoing project at Rothamsted with Steve Foster. He tested those samples of diamondback moth and it came back that they were all resistant to pyrethroid insecticides. So that means not only if, do you not control your pests if you use a pyrethroid on diamondback moth, but you knock out all the beneficials in your crop. So that means that control that you would have got from beneficials to, to control diamondback moth naturally isn't going to happen. So you've made the situation worse. Anyway, as I said, that was a whistle stop tour, um, highly biased on my projects, I must say, um, from some of the work that we do at AHDB. Um, we have a whole range of different sources of information and posters, crop walkers guides, apps, a whole range of different things to get that information out. So please do take advantage of what we've got. Um, either get on the website, email me, whatever is most convenient and best for you. Um, and we will do our utmost to help. Thank you. Any questions? We've had one much done. That's great. Katie, any questions come through? Um, a question around mon on farm monitoring. So you've given some useful tools there for crop walking, but what about traps and nets? What um, about and our, traps and nets? So they're kind of on practical on farm options for, for monitoring pests. Nets. Um, this is this is one where um, I'm hoping some of the other guys can help me on this because um, we tend to use um, pheromone sticky traps for the pests that I've been involved in. Um, does anyone have experience of, of using nets? I guess, yeah, it was just around the on practical options for on-farm monitoring, I guess. Um, yeah, there, there are a number of different um, IPM companies who, who provide different um, ways of, of sampling and mo monitoring. So, as I said, you know, I don't know everything. Ping me an email and I'll find out and get back to you. <laughs> Great. And then a similar question, really. How do you know what growers changing priorities are in terms of pest monitoring? Ah, this is one that I meant to mention, but I was a bit worried that I was waffling on too much, to be fair. Um, this is so important in what we do. We have a system of risk registers. And basically, this is, this is a spreadsheet um, filled with numbers and red, amber, green. And at, with the different crops, we have two or more grower meetings per year. And at those meetings, we will ask the growers what are the most important of the different um, pests, weeds and diseases to them. Because obviously we, we have limited resources and it is crucial that those resources are targeted to the problems that are most important to growers. Um, it strikes me as a huge feat of coordination to get all this information both in and out again. It's, it's yeah. a real sort of na national effort between a range of, 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 I guess, from growers through researchers through to communicators. It's a really strong network. 
yeah, we're, we're, we're just part of a whole team of people, um, growers, researchers. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a fantastic team and generally everyone works really well together. Um, it's, it's about information and, as I say, making priorities and, and basically talking to each other. Thank you so much, Dawn. And there's, Dawn's happy to be emailed directly if you have Absolutely. questions. Yeah. Um, and do watch the, the film. The film that the link to is in the chat is great. I watched it this morning. It's it brilliant. And much, it was a very, very slick production, I thought. It even has drone footage. So worth, worth a viewing. It's only five minutes long. Um, Thank you. Right. So last of all, the, the final presentation we have before we have a sort of wider conversation is by Tim Pratt. So one of our 40 wonderful leaf demonstration farmers and um, sc scattered up and down the land. And um, Tim, Tim farms at Wantiston Hall in Suffolk and far from Riviera, but great to be able to have you both on the same call today. Um, among other things, Wantiston is home to one of the largest areas of medieval pollarded oak woodlands in Europe. And it's primarily potato production, top focus, um, which has its own specific challenges, as I'm sure many of you'll know. Um, but that's really complemented by a diversity of, of field veg, largely irrigated, and you know, which bring their own challenges and solutions. So, um, Tim, I'm going to hand over to you for some more, more information on your systems and your um, problems and your answers. Thank you very much. No problems. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, can you see the screen? Is that all right? Perfect. Yeah, great. Lovely. Um, so, uh, all right. Hold on. Oh, no, I can't move. Ah, oh, right. So, right, carry on. Sorry. Um, so, Wanton Hall Farm, yeah, we're based in East uh, Suffolk. Um, we're quite coastal as well, like Riviera, but we have the North Sea next to us, um, which is a bit colder. Um, so, our farm is, um, is, is split up, basically. So, we're, we've got a nice big holding um, of around 780 odd hectares of the home farm. And then we contract farm another couple of farms. Uh, adding another 850 hectares to the business. So as said previously, our main business really revolves around our veg. So potatoes, onions, carrots are our main core business. Um, and obviously, depending on the land type, we are also growing a number of other crops as well. Spring cereals, also great. Vining peas, sugar beet cereals, um, swedes. We could quite a few, quite a bit of maize as well for an AD plant and also sheep um, within the rotation. Um, Sorry. So, so I'm jumping through here, but I, I've lost where I am. Right, sorry. Um, so soils within our farm, we've got um, a massive, massive variation in soils. Um, the home farm here is very light land. It's, it's heathland realistically. So we have very, um, very light soil, very poor soil. Um, it's just basically a very coarse sand. Um, we have real issues with blowing, um, and we have to manage that accordingly, obviously, with different crops that we grow. Um, depending on where we are within the farming business, we also get some very heavy land, and that really is based then around a more traditional cereal uh, rate rotation with sugar beet and maize in there as well. Um, but yeah, big variation in soil types, big variation. Um, we aim obviously is to maintain or better our soils and our health um, and I'll come on to that in a minute how we do that. Um, we're increasing fertility, we try and better our farm practices um, and a bit we try to endeavour to operate to the highest professional standards, working in a sustainable, safe and positive environment to maximise to maximize the returns and the assets we manage. Um, and with that I suppose we're still learning. We're, we're, we're trying things here every year we're slightly different weather scenarios um machinery labor whatever it might be we're all still playing around we're all still learning and trying to do a better job basically um ipm so i just did a little bit of what is ipm uh, effective environmentally sensitive approach to pest management that relies on a combination of common sense practices which i thought was quite good really um so yeah it runs down through prevention curative physical, biological, and then chemical, basically. Um, so at Wanston, what do we do? Um, I suppose I started off with crop rotation, really. Um, 
we have a big variety of crops which helps us break any cycles. Um, the rotations that we put in place are carefully selected and carefully managed for those soils that we grow. Um, on our light land, obviously there's no land drainage, but our land drainage on a heavy land, the health of our heavy land is very important. We've obviously touched on variety, um, seed selection. Um, obviously nowadays, potatoes for us, um, PCN is a big problem within our business or can be within our business. Mildew, obviously with onions and things and also aphids with um, a lot of the crops we grow to be truthful. Um, crop husbandry and hygiene. Um, we've been I think with everything, with all businesses nowadays, we've got to be very careful in soil, moving soil um, from field to field, let alone farm to farm, um, for all types of diseases, whether it's pests or or or, um, or weed seeds. Um, Interrowing, obviously, it's been talked about before. Um, because of our soil types, we 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 have a big spread of um, drilling dates. So our year typically starts in January when we start planting carrots. So we grow very early carrots all under polythene. Um, now that, that manages our light land to a respect because it doesn't blow under polythene, which is very good. But against that, we're also creating a lovely environment for weeds to grow. Um, with a loss of chemistry, we are unfortunately getting lots of weed burden within that, within that uh, carrot crop. Because obviously we leave that polythene on from January through to probably uh, May. And then we take the take the polythene off and of course everything wants to grow it's had a lovely environment and actually trying to control that weed now within our carrots is becoming very very difficult we are band spraying we're doing hoeing as well but unfortunately a lot of our uh, uh, our bed system and the way carrots are grown um, we're having to use a lot of hand labor as well so more and more staff are being required nowadays which is expensive for starters um, and also getting hold of them and of course, with COVID, there's another risk associated with that now as well. So it, it's becoming more and more of an issue. So we've got to get better at, at, at trying to hoe closer to the carrots and the onions as well. Um, and maybe slightly changing the way we do grow our carrots going forward. Um, harvesting and storage, obviously, it's it's quite important, whatever way you look at it. You know, for our onions, we saw all our onions on farm. Um, trying to select fields to, to last the season or to last a long time in store compared to uh, short-term storage onion is quite important to, to see those risks in the field um, and manage those accordingly. Um, livestock in the rotation. So um, around eight or nine years ago, we brought livestock back into rotation at Wanston. Um, having been completely um, cereal-based or veg-based, an arable farm, um, I sort of quite like the idea of bringing some livestock back into the system really. So we brought pigs onto the farm um, and pigs have worked very well within our rotation. Um, they're only on the lightest of our land because pigs aren't everybody's cup of tea and they will make a mess on slightly heavier land or sloping land where it runs and there's erosion issues. But actually on our, we've got some quite large flat fields, very, very sandy and they work an absolute treat. So pigs enable us to, um, control our volunteers very well, our volunteer potatoes. Um, they're able to, uh, they root around, they dig everything up, which is why they're so good. So they, they clear every potato you could possibly imagine they could find. So um, they work very well in that respect. And on our light land, pigs are actually two years within seven are within our rotation. So they're quite an important part of our rotation now. Um, not only are they good for clearing up volunteer potatoes, but actually they've also been, been very helpful in um, increasing fertility. Our light land is very poor fertility wise. So pigs um, lift my indices by one generally um, for the following crop for the following year. Generally, they'll stay on a field for two years, but actually will, depending on the rotation, will move every year if we want to. So they're quite, um, they're quite good. They will work with us quite well, to be truthful. Um, We've also brought sheep into rotation as well. Um, because we're very much a spring-based farm, um, onions, carrots, potatoes, and all spring-based really, we have a lot of land left over winter, um, which could be bare. So um, for the last yeah six or eight years now, again, we've been putting a lot of cover crops in um, and trying to fulfill that winter 
period, I suppose. So we also grow some spring greens on the farm. And actually the sheep work quite nicely because they're able to utilize all that, all that um, excess or waste, waste vegetable waste, I suppose, partly, but also graze cover crops to help keep the nutrients within the soil that we grow. Um, our sheep are slightly different. So we actually lamb, um, we lamb our sheep in September. Um, they naturally will breed at any time of year. So we lamb in September. So um, I actually want the most sheep on the farm in the winter because I don't have a lot of grass in the summer. So the sheep um, obviously lamb now or September. We then re run the sheep all winter on cover crops uh, and stubble turnips and things. And then we start marketing the lambs in January uh, and they're all gone by Easter basically. So for us, that works quite nicely. Um, if we sort of, it, it works quite well on our light land. We don't make a mess. Um, it helps fit with our labor profile as well. Um, and also, yeah, I'll put sugar beet tops as well. We grow a lot of sugar beets. So actually we, we graze a lot of sugar beet tops as well. Um, and it's amazing what they'll find within the field of sugar beet as well. Um, also habitat management, obviously we are a leaf demonstration farm. We are HLS. So we have quite a lot of habitat within the farm business. Um, lots of irrigation lakes which have created quite a lovely environment now all man-made um natural spring-fed reservoirs uh irrigation is obviously very very important for us um we're running uh 20 odd irrigators during the summer um well i say during the summer we're running irrigators i suppose really now from sort of april till september um so we're quite busy on irrigation and our, our land is is useless without water if we're honest so it's quite an important part. Um, tillage and cultivations, um, we're very similar to David and what he does in uh, Riviera. So we, we are reducing our tillages and cultivations. Um, we plow very little now, apart from for onions. Um, everything else is min tilled um, to try and help, you know, erosion, soil health, etc. really. Um, some pigs on the farm, obviously, I've talked about. Um, it looks lovely in the summer months, but uh, yeah, in the winter, it's not quite so pretty sometimes. Um, it can make a bit of a mess, but um, we're getting better at how we try and look after our land, to be fair, and how we work within the pigs within the season. So a lot of the pens will be subsoil during the season to try and help um, alleviate compaction and try and let the water drain away. So we're getting better um, at trying to organise those, I suppose. The electric fences are also moved every year if they're staying a second year. So actually those areas where they don't root up, they actually will move the electric fence. So they can then get to those areas so we can control as much as we can of potato volunteers. Um, cover crops that I have mentioned, obviously we're growing quite a lot of cover crops on the farm now. Um, I've just put a few um, reasons why we grow them, I suppose. Um, Organic matter is always people talk about and running, look, looking forward to elms and things. Organic matter is always discussed. Realistically, we, can, we can't really increase organic matter very easily. Um, if we put muck, cover crops and everything else year upon year, we very rarely get a, an increase. Our land is so poor and so um, harsh on some of the land, it's very difficult. Um, but it does help obviously with water holding, which is really quite important for us with our veg. Um, soil erosion, uh, increased fertility, animal fodder, obviously for sheep, um, reduction in weeds and wildlife biodiversity um, and improved structure and hopefully yield, which is what it comes back down to really. Um, cover crops, we've tried lots of cover crops over the years. Um, we're still learning uh, which way, how we should do it. Um, we are actually, we have um, quite a nice simple establishment regime now which we know what we're doing so it's a one pass operation um, we have a mixture of stubble turnips which we generally use the sheep um, brassica mix um, some black oats and vetch rye cover clops uh, a bio thumb which is a pcn control and also radish brassica mix as well um, we did a number of trials uh, two years ago or three years ago now of different um, crops to grow uh, and to see which one worked or which one didn't work I suppose they've all got their po well a number of them have got their positive sides to it but they also do have some negative sides as well um, cost being one quite big one um, there's some very good grasses out there but they are very expensive um, yeah we end up farm saving some rye often and vetch we can buy in quite cheaply 
bit of a mixture of stubble turnips works quite well really um, but you can see there's some very good rooting action on some of the crops we grow um, there's a bit of grass we grew as well um, so yeah the sheep sheep love them sheep do very well on them um, the brassica mixes that we have grown um, this is a lovely picture because it grew really well but of course we are very light and very sandy if we don't get a rain on this cover mix then there's not the crop like you would expect like there is there um, it can be a bit variable on dry years um, we wouldn't irrigate a crop like this obviously water is too valuable for us so we'd be watering potatoes onions carrots and things um, but yeah it can work very well actually and then we also grew some biofumigant um, again to try and help it's just another added um armor armory to our profile i suppose so we're trying to control pcn it's really important for us so between the pigs the biofumigant the brassicas that we grow obviously giving off a bit of gas as well so all of those hopefully help control um control pcn a bit more and that's it thank you very much Thank you so much, Tim. That's brilliant. It's um, really, really interesting in the combination of different things you're using for your PCN, and I really like your pig policy. A um, couple of questions in the chat, which, which I was wondering as well, kind of, you obviously got the added fertility benefits of the pigs. Are there any real downsides? Do you have, do you have soil compaction issues with them, or do you manage that with the rotation? Yeah, we do have compaction issues, and it is a problem. Um, but we do spend quite a lot of time of um, particularly where the dry cells are, where there's big volumes of pigs in certain areas or in like a, in a radial, as they call them sort of thing in the circle, there is issues because obviously they have a tent where they all live and there is a concentration of fertility, but we do spend a long time moving that fertility around and really incorporating it. We subsoil it to make sure all the compaction is gone. So there are issues, but funny enough, when I first started to bring them on, um, and I was ever so worried about the risk of very high fertility in places and then nothing in another place. Um, we haven't actually seen that as bad as I thought it was going to be. I mm. think it's just time is so need so much needed, you know, spreading that manure around and making sure the gangways have got muck on and everything is done right. It pays off in the longer run, I think. It sort of ties in with this question here as well about has it has that level of diversity in particular introducing livestock to the system, has that increased your work changed or increased your workload? Is it something that's been a, a, like a labour juggle? Um, yeah, it has. The pigs are quite nice because they are let out to somebody else. So they sort all the labour out for the pigs, but the sheep have definitely been a bit of a change. Um, it's, it's worked well. And that's why I went with the Dorset to be truthful originally, because they can lamb at any time. Um, it works well i can i can lamb when i want to lamb and actually for us the september works quite nicely we have to get a bit of rain in august we've got a bit of grass and we can lamb the ewes all outside um so it works quite well then um but hopefully going forward you know we'll actually increase our numbers of sheep to be fair going forward so yeah it's working well and i expect at that point we'll need a bit more of a full-time shepherd coming onto the mix Thank you. Now I've got one question, which kind of, but before we go into a wider conversation, it, but I think it brings everyone together. I think this is something we've all got in common here. And it's a question about aphids, which is a subject close to my own heart. And um, although I've been more arable focused in my aphid interest. Um, and it's just about aphids as uh, vectors of virus. And it's just such a big challenge facing field vegetables. And is this something that, that, that how are you managing aphids as we move into a point, as Ellis mentioned earlier, where there's just less chem chemical control options. I don't know, I'm gonna start maybe with, with you, Tim, ask if it's an issue for you, and then, then sort of move across between you. So we're still, we grow our own seed potatoes locally on sort of virgin land. Um, and obviously viruses are a big issue for us. So we, we are still spraying on a weekly basis for aphid control. Um, there's not a lot else I can do at the moment, unfortunately. But yeah, we are. And, and David, what about you? How's your aphid? Do, do you find the beneficials that come into your cover crops help help in that battle? We we think they're helping. Um, obviously, we haven't been um, haven't been growing these sort of cover crops for long enough yet to 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 see 
whether it's working or not. You know, I, I, I think of one particular block where we had some self-sown phosphenia come up. Um, I didn't see any aphids in that block of land. Um, whether that's a coincidence or whether um, the phosphenia brought the hoverflies in or, you know, I don't know is the answer to that one. Um, we, we haven't lost all our weapons against aphids yet. Um, but the, the, you know, we still got things we can do. Um, and, you know, virus wise in a brassica crop, um, they're, they're not there long enough to do too much to, a, you know, uh, um, especially a summer brassica. Uh, it's more the, the, the um, contamination from aphids on, on, a, on a, something you want to sell, basically. Um, but uh, yes. There's, have you got anything to add, Ellis? Or no, that covers it, David. The um, <clears throat> the very mark does control the aphids, but of course it is a systemic product. So once the aphid is fed on the plant, it's transmitted the virus if it is anywhere. But like David says, we don't see much uh, virus issue on Nebraska crop. We we don't suffer too badly <clears throat> um, with virus in the courgettes either. In Cornwall, although virus in courgettes is a big problem in other parts of the country where it's hot, hotter and drier. Uh, but we think most of the aphids blow from the west up to the east anyway, so keep them off our crop. Send them yeah. over. Send them over. <laughs> Dawn, have right. you got an oversight into this? Have you can you can you can can you um give us a kind of national view on the aph aphid trends, maybe with changing weather patterns and <laughs> <Don't care. laughs> Dawn? Oh, you, you, yeah, <laughs> you want me to answer that one. Oh, I was hoping someone else would. Um, it's, it, it is a problem that's getting worse, as Alice mentioned earlier. We're losing more and more actives. And the problem is if you've got a limited number of actives, you've got very limited options for protecting the efficacy of those products. So you get development of resistance. And as I say, this is why we have this um, project at Rothamsted with Steve Foster, who, who's uh, you know, a world expert on this kind of thing. Um, and also the pest monitoring work that we do is used to flag up these problems with CRD. And these are the kind of conversations that we're having um whenever we we can to be honest um with people who we hope are listening so that we can protect what we have um as i say scepter plus is looking at new products coming through the system there's more and more um biologicals there which are easier to get through um the authorization process so it, it, it's like a conveyor belt all the time. It, there's a huge amount of work from everyone from the growers onwards to try and keep up with this situation. I think that kind of leads on or that starts to answer really my sort of next question, which is what's in the pipeline? What's the next step for you all in, in IPM? You know, what are, the, what are the upcoming threats and what do you see as being your upcoming solutions, I guess, kind of going back to, to David, maybe. What are you going to do next? You've done done a lot. What's coming? What what, what next? <laughs> well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, if, if we can look at, um, you know, what's happening with the, with the um, biology in, in, in the cover crops and, um, you know, what's happening with the soil, um, there's, there's lots of stuff we've got to learn, I think. Um, in, you know, using different cover crops in between commercial crops, um, and and draw in these um, beneficials. Basically, um, uh, chemistry-wise, I'm not a chemist, so <laughs> you know. Um, hopefully, um, Dawn and company are working on the the, the chemical um, side of it. But um, I, you know, I think we have got a lot to learn from from um, other plants growing in the field, other than your crop, basically. Do you think there's, there's um, the need to actually, and there probably is someone doing this and I don't know about it, but um, monitoring um, 
beneficials in both cover crops and um, any any other crop? Is the work going on that people know about to do that? Is that a question to me, Dawn, is it? Um, whoever will listen or answer, to be <laughs> fair. No, I don't know of any. No, no, is this something we ought to be doing? Maybe, yes. Yeah. yeah um, you know. does, does anyone on the call have any insights into that? Is that research that anybody's aware of, that kind of monitoring of, I guess, is that landscape scale beneficial monitoring? Is that, is that what, what, what you're sort of su suggesting, like looking at what crop situation is compared to adjacent cover crops? Yeah, well, we have anecdotal evidence to suggest that, you know, cover crops are encouraging beneficials. And certainly the example that I used about the use of pyrethroids wiping out beneficials, um, people definitely notice the effects of beneficials when they wipe them out. Alice, have you got any um, kind of pipeline perspectives on, on aphidology? Not on aphids as such, but on the pest side of it, we, um, like David says, we're using the cultural controls because we're losing all the, a lot of the actives. The really it's a coming together where we've got the seed industry coming up with resistance and tolerance in their varieties. So we're using those more we're together with the cover cropping, the cultural control, the biological which means that we rely less on the chemistry, but we do still need it. So hopefully, like David says, someone is coming up with new active ingredients to replace the ones that we're losing. The trouble is that the European Union and co are taking them away because of toxicity, but really by their very nature, we need them to be fairly toxic because we need them to kill the pests that we're targeting them at. So it's a difficult sort of circle to, to square, if you like. To have a pesticide that's not harmful but is harmful that's what they're asking for it's very difficult to um to find that so that integration of all the different sort of strategies which you're referring to i but for you tim who's running an integrated farm management system does, does that stack up does that make sense is that is that the same page you're on over in the east yeah it's, it's all the same though, isn't it it's all it's lots of little things to hopefully create something a bit bigger by the end of it basically so it's variety it's field selection it's you know um what surrounds the field even you know it's all those little things which have a little bit of an effect and it's that continual effect which slowly builds to hopefully make a, a bigger effect i suppose um to try and get you through and what's next for you at wanton hall farms what what's your next step in integrated pest management what 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 you um, got lined up? I suppose, yeah, we need to be monitoring a bit more, if we're honest. Um, we don't do any intercropping, I suppose, so we're not growing two crops in the same field. It's still a bit um, potatoes here, onions here, carrots there, or whatever. So we're not, you know, we, we could be looking at growing cover crop within the field, you know, strips of cover crop or something, maybe to try and help beneficials. Um, so we're not doing that yet. So maybe we should be looking at trying that. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting isn't it we should maybe have a look I'm, and i'm interested to know with both both of your systems whether you you use the um the information that dawn's team come out with this is 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 the kind of national monitoring service you know is is, is that something that, that you participate in yeah, we we use it um definitely to give us an idea of highs and lows of numbers and things so it's 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 very useful to have around to be truthful um it's just an, it's almost another set of eyes isn't it um we're out walking every day but you know somebody else who you know almost has been out as well and can can report it as such then it, it's useful yeah same as tim really um you know you always look and see when the first diamond back moth uh, appears or yeah. first aphid you know it's um it's useful stuff has anything else come up in the chat? We've got any more questions from the from the wider floor? We've had a comment from Richard Binks from Coppert um, in regards to pest monitoring. Um, that there is an app available which has been developed by Coppert, um, which is to assist with pest monitoring. So um, perhaps Richard could either um, pay something on here or, or tell us a little bit about that. 
just that we could send out afterwards. Um, <clears throat> yeah, pest, pest monitoring is something that's quite close to my heart, given that I ran the National Pest Monitoring Service for ADAS um, in the early 2000s, late 90s to 2000s. I'm still involved in that now. Uh, Copper as a business bought a company called Ecos um, about 18 months ago, two years ago, and took over their pest trapping and monitoring systems, um, which is what they supply. <clears throat> but, but recently they, they've developed um, an app, which is called Natch Tech Scout, which was predominantly developed for indoor use to monitor white fly thrips, etc., in tomatoes. But um, they have looked at developing that system for outdoor use. Um, so it's using mobile technology, uh, taking photographs of sticky traps, counting the insects on the traps, identifying the species. And they've, they're looking at the moment at onion fly and carrot fly initially, but obviously we'll, we'll be able to move that out to things like bean seed fly, etc. in the future. Um, if anybody's interested in the app, um, you know, certainly we can have a discussion over the winter about possibly trying to run some, uh, run some work with growers next, next year. So, so yeah, and again, trapping and pest monitoring. I just had a comment about the beneficial insect monitoring. We do do that in some organic farms that I deal with in Norfolk. Um, uh, but it's very difficult and it's very time consuming and costly. Um, if there was an easier way of doing it, i.e. through maybe trapping and monitoring through technology, then I think that would certainly speed things up and make it a bit more useful um, for, for growers. Um, because the national picture is one thing, but on a local level, it's uh, it's definitely a, sometimes a different thing. So, so yeah. Thank you. But you can contact me after today if you want to talk about the Natch Tech app, etc. That's, that's yes, not... that's a really important thing for our field vegetables is that water indoor protected cropping and indoor horticulture does have it was sort of decades ahead of the game in terms of integrated pest management. Um, with, that, with those more contained and controlled environments and those really high value concentrations. Um, so I guess that's something we look to their experience of progression. Um, thank you very much. Has anyone got anything else they'd like to ask each other or ourselves before we start to wrap up? Okay. Right, we've covered it all, we've sorted, IPM, done, check. Um, right, stay in touch. And um, my parting thoughts personally from this conversation are that IPM isn't a plan and it isn't a fantasy and it isn't a luxury and it's not a nice to have. It's something that's already happening. It's something that we are already doing and that you're already doing. Um, and I think it's, it's evident from these conversations that it's a really uh, fast evolving and dynamic uh, environment out there. Um, I thank you very, very much to our four presenters today. Really, really appreciate your time. There's no such thing as a non-busy week in any of your worlds. So to, to make this hour and a half and the time we spent discussing it is, is very much appreciated. And thank you all for coming as well. Um, the direction of travel, um, I think, is positive. Um, and to take this forward, one part that we can play in that is to offer, in terms of LEAF, um, is to offer you our experience and, and our conversations with our demonstration farmers, with our innovation centres, um, and the, the, the interest in taking forward these conversations and developing practical, realistic, achievable, on-farm guidance. Um, do check out our Simply Sustainable Pest Management booklet. We'd love you to read that. And I'll be presenting it at the AHDB Agronomist um, Induction Conference at the beginning of December. Um, and there's also the Agricology website has a huge range of farmer resources. Um, Casey's just put the little link in the chat down there. That's really worth checking out. And I think it's fair to say that one of those farmer profiles uh, might indeed be David Thomas. Is that right, Katie? It will be very soon. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, thanks again. Um, don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any specific or more general questions. Dawn's happy to be contacted individually. If you want to have any specific questions for any of the other panellists that we haven't managed to ask today, 
um, come through me and I'll, I'll check in with them and try and point you in the right direction. Um, so thank you, Katie, for DJing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And I just leave it to all the rest of you to say goodbye. And that, that, that's it from me. Thank you again.